Hello, my name is Nancy Gillard. I'm the pastor at First Presbyterian Church, Clinton, Missouri. And this is our midweek message and Bible study for the Sunday morning sermon, which um, this week the scripture is going to be from Matthew 14, 22 through 36. So we're in Matthew 14. This is the story about Jesus who walked on water. You can also find this story in Mark and in John, and I would encourage you to look those up as well because they're not exactly the same as what is recorded in Matthew 14, and we are in 22 through 36. So if you would please bow your heads, and let's continue this Bible study with an opening prayer. Almighty God, as we study your word, we would ask that you would completely clear our minds and our hearts of all of those things that clutter our way of thinking, as well as our way of feeling, so that we can simply draw near to you as your holy word comes into our life. God, in all of our studies of your holy word, help us, Lord, to listen with our mind and our heart. And as you teach us, let us be aware of things in our lives that are cluttering and keeping us from being disciples of Jesus Christ, or maybe things in our lives that are deceitful, things that are keeping us from having a full relationship with Jesus Christ. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Lord, teach each one of us, correct us, so that we might come to Jesus Christ and listen to Christ as he fills our heart with forgiveness and joy, life abundant, and life everlasting. Amen. So if you have your Bible in front of you, we'll be reading from Matthew 14, 22 through 36. And this story follows immediately after last week's Bible miracle, which was the feeding of the 5,000. I mentioned during that Bible study that um, the feeding of the 5,000 comes right after Jesus finds out that his cousin, John, that we uh, affectionately call John the Baptist, was killed, was martyred by Herod. Jesus knows about this, and he is saddened. Jesus escapes with his, or departs with his um, disciples, goes to a place that he hopes is a quiet place, and yet what we found out last week was that the crowd fo followed him. Fortunately, because the crowd followed him, he had compassion on them. He healed many of them. And then he performed the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. If this is something that you'd like to find out more about, I encourage you to go to last week's midweek Bible study as well as last week's sermon. And that would have been the sermon for August the 2nd. So here is the reading for today. Matthew 14, 22 through 36. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And the crowds were those that gathered that we now know attended the, fe the feast of the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountains by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by waves, was far away from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong winds, he became afraid, frightened, and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, you have a little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped worshiped him, saying, You are the Son of God. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This beautiful story about God once again through Jesus performing this miracle for the disciples. As I have been studying this passage, I believe that what I probably will do on Sunday is to emphasize the end of the story. That end verse in 33 that says, they worshipped him. The disciples worshipped him and said, truly you are the son of God. If you've been following these messages in the last couple weeks, there has been a dot-to-dot -dot puzzle that's been put together by our Lord Jesus Christ so that those that are following him can understand. Two weeks ago, we learned about this little bit of faith that we might have as in, uh, I think Jesus talked about a mustard seed that then grows into a great tree. And then we also heard about a, a tiny little uh, piece of yeast that then is able to uh, make bread enough, raise the flour enough for a wedding party. Once again, here in this scripture, we hear Jesus speaking to Peter, to the individual Peter, and calling him, O ye of little faith. And those two verses, one about the mustard seed and one about the yeast, are both stories about how a little faith can do great things. So Peter has heard these stories. Peter continues to see Jesus as he feeds 5,000 people. He has witnessed these things. And here, when it comes to Jesus coming to them in a ghost-like manner, Peter is the one who says, I will step out of the boat. My goodness, as we were doing Bible study earlier today about this particular passage, we continued to turn back to words that started with F. Words like faith and facts. Do you have all the facts before you get out of the boat? Did Peter have any facts when he got out of the boat? Uh, one of the F words that we came up with was fear. Did Peter, was Peter afraid when he got out of the boat? Maybe not as much as the other disciples, but was Peter? Did he face fear? One of the F words was fragile. How fragile is our faith sometimes when we are trying to understand what it means to follow Jesus Christ? And then certainly they were frightened. They were all frightened. It says that they were because there was this great storm. There was this great wind. And then they see Jesus coming to them. It may be helpful to you, for you to know as you are reading through scripture that verse 25 reads, And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. In nautical terms, they divided the day into four watches. This particular watch was the time that we would say is between 3 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock. So before dawn, but still while it's dark. So they weren't able to see who it was that was watching them. It was a storm. There wasn't a moonlit night. They were afraid. So frightened certainly is one of our F's. Um, oftentimes as we are studying scripture, we have to throw caution to the wind sometimes and begin to interpret what this passage means for us. But I also like to remember that what Jesus was doing as he's telling these stories is he is building a foundation so that people can believe that he is the Messiah. So when Jesus finally comes to what we call the Garden of Gethsemane, those moments of Jesus' end of life, when he stands before the Sanhedrin and the high priests, they challenge him and say, Are you the Son of God? And he says, It is as you say so. As Jesus actually goes to the cross, those that have been following Jesus' ministry understand that he is the one that is fulfilling the words of the prophet. And let me ask you, if you want to write these down or if you actually want to look them up, you're going to want to look up Psalm. Well, we're going to go to Isaiah first. You want to look up Isaiah, particularly verses 43, 1 through 3. And here we have 
the song, the um, uh, prophet Isaiah, who all the disciples have learned about since they were young boys. They all went to school so they could learn these words, even if they were from a laboring family, like they were fishermen or they were farmers or whatever. They still went to school as children. And so they would know this passage from Isaiah 43. And Isaiah 43 says this, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O believers, O followers, O family of Jacob, who formed you, Israelites, from that family of Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. And now listen carefully. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And though the rivers, I'm sorry, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So when the disciples see this time of rushing water, they can hearken back to these words of Isaiah, where in verse 3 it says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So they know these words, and now they see Jesus as he is coming to them, walking on the water, and then stilling the waters. Because when he got in the boat, what happened? The, will, the winds stilled. Then we also have this from Psalm 77, verses 16 through 19. These verses directly refer to that other event that every Jewish child would have known about when the disciples of Jesus Christ were growing up, and that would be when the Israelites, after they left Egypt, walked across the Red Sea when Moses parted the waters. Once again, here are the waters that begin to overflow and threaten to drown the people of Israel, God's people, and there's a miracle. And the people walk through and they are safe, and they are saved. So these verses from Psalm 77, 16 through 19. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, the waters were afraid, and the very deep trembled. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Jesus walked on the water. He left no footprints. These words, the disciples would have known about these things. And as they hear Jesus's words and as they live it themselves, they realize that Jesus is the prophet that they are waiting for. Jesus is the Messiah who can love and forgive the prophet, the Messiah, the Savior who can save us from our sins and who can also offer us peace and hope and life and life abundant. Um, it's a very interesting passage. The passage as we see Peter walking on water, we hear Peter, as he calls out to Jesus, and these are our words as well. Peter says, Lord, if you command me to come to you on the water, I will come. It's a foolish idea, isn't it? For any of us to think that in the middle of a storm, we'd get out of a boat and we'd start walking toward anyone, more or less a ghost. But Peter says, if you command me, I will walk. I will come out to see you. I also will walk on water. And it is interesting in this passage that Peter does walk on water. Now he sinks, but goodness, he does spend some time walking on water. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. And I believe that it pleases Jesus. Though we are human and we will sink, Jesus still, in the future passages that we'll get to, still calls Peter the rock, still says, I know that you are more sinkable than you are floatable, but on you, I will build my church. You are Peter the rock. Peter is not perfect, and neither are we. I think personally that I would hunker down in the bottom of the boat and cling to a life jacket. That would be me. 
But the story is about courage, isn't it? The story is about faith. The story is about throwing caution to the wind. One of the friends on the Bible study today said this, if you want to get your feet in the water, you have to get out of the boat. If you want to get your feet in the water, you have to get out of your boat. And that is simply said, but so very true. A couple of weeks ago, we learned about the mustard seed, such a small thing where such great um, things grow from, as well as yeast, such a small thing where so much um, bounty comes from. It's Jesus saying, you just have to have a little faith. And that's what happened with Peter. He just had a little faith. And with that little faith, he walked on water. He didn't stay up forever, but he did walk a little bit. It's more than I could have done. I've, I've got to give it to Peter. Good guy. Um, he tried. He tried. There are so many different things that we want to emphasize in this chapter. But I do want to end by saying at least the disciples in one voice, after Peter and Jesus came back and got into the boat, and the wind stilled, they were at least able to say, truly you are the Son of God. And this is the first time that that really happens, where in one voice they all agree, yes, Jesus is the Son of God, truly. You know, as we live through our lives, and one of the things that I certainly will make clear in my sermon is that it's not easy being in the boat. It's not easy having the storm around us. It's not easy trying to figure out what is next. And I think that's true for the church in these days as well. It is not easy for us as the church to continue to say, it's too difficult. It is not easy for us as the church to, to say, well, we have found peace in the church before, but now things are just an uproar. What we learned through this particular passage, this miracle, is that the church, the boat, being in the boat has always been a curiously difficult place to be. It's always been that place that God has called us to be, but it's never been easy. My prayer for our church is that we would continue to be people that would figure out how to go past our fear, how to go past just having to calculate the facts, how to go past being afraid, all those F words, how to get past those and simply linger on faith. We are fragile, but can we have faith enough to get out of the boat to join together with Jesus? Because it is safer with Jesus than anywhere else. As we understand that Jesus is our hope to keep us from sinking we also know that Jesus is our Savior. It is the peace of Jesus which continues to be with us even in the midst of the storm. I know you have storm in your life. I do in mine too. But it is the peace of Jesus where the disciples can say together, truly you are the Son of God. It's that peace, that hope, that future, another F word that we can find in Jesus Christ. Please bow your heads and let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that as your disciples, you teach us, each one of us, all the time. But Lord, for the one that is listening to this that may be going through a storm in their life, Lord, I would pray that they would look up, that they would see that Jesus is in the boat with them, and that in that, as they see Jesus facing them, looking at them, that they would be able to say, truly, you are the Son of God, and live the rest of their lives with the hope, the forgiveness, the love that can only come from Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you all.
And um, if you can join us this Sunday for Drive In Church, we'll also be taking communion. We'll be doing that in a safe, uh, safe way for you all. So we will be taking communion. If you want to bring, if you're coming to drive-in service and you want to bring your own elements, your own bread, your own juice or wine, you can do that. Uh, but we, if you can't join us at drive-in worship at the corner of 3rd and Franklin Street here in Clinton, Missouri, and if you want to go ahead and take the communion yourself, you're welcome to do that. We invite you to join us for drive-in church, but until we see each other face-to-face -face again, God bless you, and we reach out our loving arms in embrace. Amen.